，呃，接下来我们的议程是由我们就是在中研院物理所任职的林彦勋为我们带来，就是在 Computer Vision 上面用 Bayesian Reasoning 做应用的讲题。那我们欢迎讲者，谢谢。呃<咳> ，OK， 好，那虽然这个 English c l o c k i n g 不过我用中文先讲几句话，就是等一下 QA 或者在 QA 的时候，你可以比较轻松一点，你们可以用中文问，就是没有问题的哈。OK， so 啊啊 ，Let me get back to English again. So good morning, everyone, and my name is Yan Xun, and I'm glad to be here today to show you with some of my recent side projects, uh, on the computer vision. So Oh no! This talk is about uh, it's about the applications uh, of Bayesian inferences uh, in the computer vision problem. So let me tell you more later. Okay. So before I get started, so let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Institute of Physics, Academy of Sinica, and my specialty is. Uh, on the astroparticle physics, uh, the dark matter detection include uh, including theoretical and experimental, as well as the computational physics that embody simulation, Monte Carlo simulation, and model building based on the quantum and classical systems. I'm also acquainted uh, uh, with per, uh, Bayesian parameter estimation, and I, if you want to know me more, I have a Google site and all the code script, so you can download it from my GitHub. Okay, so let me briefly tell you what I'm uh, going to do today. So there's an outline. So I divided my talk today into four parts. So in part one, I would like to briefly introduce what is a digital image and how can we reason pixels with Bayesian inference. And in part two, due to the, despite the, uh, the last of math in the part one, in part two, I would like to demonstrate with uh, some examples, particularly focus on these three: a base image denoising, the impenting, and blinding convolution. Again, after these uh, two parts, due to the vast growth and impact of the new, uh, convolutional neural network uh, recently, I will conduct a very short comparison between these two methods. One is base inference, the traditional way. The other is uh, used the uh, CNN way, particularly focused on the convolutional autoencoder. So after these three parts, I would like to address a short summary and QA section. Okay, so let me uh, get started. Let me by start by asking, some qu by asking a question. So what is a digital image to be exact? So let's begin by a natural scene, means a camera here. So in the beginning, this camera sees a green part here. There are just lots of a bunch of tree leaves. So physically, it is just lots of it is just lots of photons uh, that carry certain wavelengths that we uh, recognize as green and propagate to the camera CCD, as well as the other photons from these places. So the natural scene it is compressed by infinity uh, infinite photons. So the resolution is in general infinite, meaning that you can zoom in such a natural scene without limitations. So can, you can see very, very tiny structures that you cannot see in the distant way. However, such huge amount of information, the almost infinite information carried by this countless photon cannot actually be stored in a finite memory space. So to record a digital image, the mass is, this kind of information carried by the photons must be downsampling by the camera CCD and undergo some digital process that produce the finite data size, such as a JPG or a raw file, and then store in the, and then store, send into the memory card and store them. And then of course you can check out this uh, data, this JPG or picture files later. Okay, so when we recorded a, a colorful digital image, what does this color really mean? So physically, color are just photons uh, carrying different wavelengths that we recognize it as colors in a cognitive sense, a cognitive level. However, digitally, they are just the information 
of the original natural thing that store in the three channels, the RGB channels, that are the red channels, the green channel, and the blue channels. So by integrating the information from these three channels, then we get a, a digital color image. So uh, actually, to be clear, there are lots of ways to characterize color. So RGB is just one of them. There are also HSV or HEX channel, that, but I will only talk about the RGB channel in today's talk. So let's take a further look of the recorded digital image. You probably noticed that such a digital image is more coarse grained compared to the natural scene. So the natural scene is rich with structure and lots of sharp boundaries compared to the recorded digital image. This is due to the natural scene is comprised by the infinity photons, so the resolution is almost infinite. However, you cannot actually record such huge amount of the uh, information, so you must be downsampled by the camera CCD. So in that case, the di recorded digital image looks more class grand, so you cannot do it uh, without limitation. In general, there are fundamental units that uh, compress the digital image, recorded digital image, such fundamental unit that we call the pixel. So a color image, so just color just two human sensations. And to this digital image, imagine that this each square is the, is the fundamental unit of a digital image uh, that we call a pixel. So if there's a pixel here, uh, imagine this square is just a pixel and carrying the olive color. So we see olive color. So now we want to ask that does the computer see olive as we did? In general, the answer is no. If we take a further look on this pixel here, the computer actually sees a bunch of, uh, a type of digits that contains three numbers. So each number is between the zero and 255. So there are total uh, 256 uh, levels to characterize the color information in each channel. So of course, by integrating the information uh, as such pixels, then computer can get a, can reproduce what the color really means to human sense. But the computer sees numbers, actually, not colors. So now, the digital image is composed by some fundamental units that we call pixels. And the color are actually a bunch of numbers. So in that case, we can manipulate these numbers by giving some mathematical models. OK, so let's go back again, our digital image here. So again, let's focus on this tiny square region here. But this time, do imagine this just a lot of pixels aggregating in this uh, square region, but instead of a single pixels. So by zooming in this part, we see nine pixels with brown colors because they come from the, these house bricks regions. So they're just a, a brown, dark brown, or skin colors. Of course, there's a little bit of outline here. So you can see that all the pixels, the colors in the adjacent pixel, they share the similar colors. So to the computer sense, it sees a bunch of a similar digits, similar numbers in the adjacent region. So if we transform this color region into what computer really sees, it sees a lot of number, but all the numbers are actually very close. So like this is close to 110, this is 120. So the numbers are actually uh, very similar to each in the adjacent region. So now we want to ask if these numbers are very are similar to each other in the neighborhood. So is there any correlations between these numbers? So if the correlation does exist, can we build some mathematical model to describe uh, such correlations? In that case, we can deduce uh, the pixel uh, or, or, or pixel information if some of them are lost. So now this is what I want to tell you in this slide. So again, these nine pixels, we have a center value, this blue one called 109. So this is our original information of the pixel values, but to some reasons, uh, it is deteriorated or corrupted. So now the information is lost and cannot be seen to the present day. So we use acts to denote that because we cannot observe this pixel at this moment. But 
the neighborhood, its neighborhood stay in touch. So we use the N to characterize its neighborhood. And from the previous slide, by examining lots of digital image, we found that if the pixels are in the adjacent regions, they are similar. So they must be share some correlations. So if the mathematical model that describes such correlation can be built, even this one, the information of this one is lost, we still can restore it by observing its neighborhood pixels here. So the most probable x or the estimate on x uh, is the one that maximizes the probability predicted by our probabilistic model. But you see that maybe you will find that these A neighborhoods are not enough to restore a public X here. Then you can further connect this, this X to the further pixels or distant clicks. So in that case, you have more neighborhood information to restore the missing information uh, in the center pixel here. And to your knowledge, the web that uh, describes all the correlations between the adjacent and neighborhoods that we call this web actually a Markov blanket. So when a Markov blanket is given, and the mathemat uh, when the Markov blanket and the probabilistic model or the mathematical model describe such correlations are given, in general, uh, any uh, lost information of the pixel can be reproduced in this way. But this is just uh, in the conceptual uh, sense. So. The X, the lost information of X can be uh, fully reconstructed according to its neighborhood by some mathematical model. But to compute such a mathematical model, perhaps it's really hard because to the computer vision, such model is in general ear post. So we have to rewrite it through the Bayesian rules. So now the original model is decomposed uh, into, the, uh, into the two parts. One is called the likelihood part that describes our model or our straightforward model that describes the correlation between the X, the lost X and its neighborhood. And the other one is called the prior, prior on X. So such prior on X gives us some information or some prior guess or even constraint on the preliminary, on the preliminary probable preliminary value of the X here. So in our talk, uh, I will particularly ch choose the most the easiest one, the easiest likelihood that is described by the L2 known. So in that case, the uh, relations between the uh, X and its neighborhood can be completely described by the Euclidean space, uh, Euclidean distance. And to the prior knowledge on X, there are actually no definitive way to do that. So there are plenty, plethora of choices in the, uh, to the, Academic, uh, academic regions, such as you can choose with the maximum entropy criterion, or some natural image statistic, or even if you have a pre-trained deep learning model, you can use that to predict the possible uh, prior value on this X here before you sending it into the restoration process. And of course, if you are not satis satisfied uh, by the first three, you can build up your own model, your user divided hard model, to describe the prior knowledge on X depends on your uh, previous investigation on this problem. But in this talk, I will mainly focus on the maximum entropy criterion here. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me briefly summarize the part one here. Uh, in part one, I briefly describe what is a digital image and the fundamental units are actually uh, pixels here. And each pixel, uh, each pixel contains the original information of the natural scene uh, by the three RGB channel, and each channel can take 250 gray levels. So total, there are 16 million choices for each color choices for each pixel. So, to your knowledge, that for full HD pictures, there are this kind of much possible state. Uh, contain all the information, color information, all the pattern of a full HD image. So this number is, in general, enormously gargantuan. So to select it, uh, the possible solution or the possible underlying patterns by enumerating them all is, uh, of course, very absurd because the ergodicity is impossible to achieve uh, in a reasonable time. So in that case, 
a plausible mathematical model must be built or must be given that the lost information, the X, uh, can be restored or can be restored or reconstructed uh, by its uh, neighborhood here. In that case, so it means that the information of the original X uh, can be fully understanding by its local region. So, in that case, we can have the X in a reasonable in a reasonable time, and the computational efficiency is uh, improved. Uh, uh, is enormously uh, improved without enumerating this all kind of things in the picture ensemble. Okay, so this is just to your knowledge. This likelihood describes our uh, model that describes uh, the X and its neighborhood. And the PX is the preliminary constraint on the X before we send in uh, this picture into the restoration uh, process. So uh, let me start my, so I have uh, briefly introduced uh, part one. In part one, there are uh, plenty of mathematical concepts, so it's a little bit abstract and perhaps a little bit boring. So let me start from the part two by lots of uh, examples. So the first one is the denoising uh, using the Bayesian inference. So uh, let's take a baby step here, uh, starting from some a binary image example. So I don't know if you can see something underlying this binary, uh, binary picture here. Uh, perhaps you can see something underlying this noisy pattern, but you just cannot see through it because there are lots of unwanted region. So uh, by just looking at this noisy picture, nothing can be deduced. But we know if there are some underlying pattern inside this noise picture, perhaps we can by removing such noise and get the possible underlying latent clean image of such noise picture here. So in the binary case, I uh, give you two examples. One is called the ICN, the iterated conditional mode, and the other is called the Gibbs sampling method. Both algorithms uh, have the same origin that from the probabilistic model. However, to the ICN, the results, the out outcome is deterministic. On the other hand, the Gibbs sampling is totally different. The outcome is probabilistic. It contains uh, fully randomness within the results of this Gibbs sampling. So let me start by denoising this uh, noise, binary, noise binary image here. So first, let's take a look on this iterated conditional ICM with multiple iterations. So you can see that, clearly you can see that after 10 iterations, the ICM algorithm do not, uh, will not, would not improve the results. The results, the denoise results, reach a stable solution after 10 more iterations. But the things were totally different, uh, uh, were totally different when we look at this Gibbs sampling here. So you can see that even after 10 iterations, the Gibbs sampling still uh, improves the denoise, uh, the, 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 the denoise results here compared to the ICM here. So both, uh, they, uh, they had the 20 iteration to do this denoising, but the outcome for this Gibbs sampling is much more better than the ICM way. This is due to the uh, probabilistic, uh, uh, intrinsic probabilistic uh, feature of such algorithm. A possible explanation to, uh, to, to explain that why the Gibbs sampling gives you a better result is probably due to that uh, the randomness of such a probabilistic algorithm. So such randomness uh, can make the algorithm escape the local mass maxima and settle down in the global maxima uh, in its final result. So this is some advantage to use the probabilistic algorithm uh, in the computer vision problems. So this is a baby step of the first example that the binary denoise, binary denoise, but, okay, oh sorry. So this is a ground truth image, which is a Garfield cat. But, so uh, this is 
the binary, de uh, binary, binary example is my first example on the de denoising result. But to the modern times, it is rarely used the binary image because the color image is the way. Most of digital pictures are stored uh, with, colorful, uh, with these colorful pictures here instead of binary or gray levels. So our final goal is to denoise the color image. So in the beginning, we have a color image, color picture, clean color pictures that describe uh, that there's a cute cat here. Then by adding some noise, you can see that the PSN are index uh, for this color noise image is 16 here. The PSN is some kind of index to evaluate the performance of some uh, of the certain algorithms. So in the beginning, if we have a PSN with such value, so by sending it into some algorithm, and the produced results can improve the PSN value, then it means such an algorithm have a, a good performance on this task here. So now we have a noise image here. So you can see that the structure of the original picture are actually destroyed by this high frequency uh, color noise. And of course, as well as the, uh, the, the details are now <laughs> deteriorated. So the goal, again, is to send this noise image uh, with certain denoise process, and we hope that such denoise process can reproduce the latent clean picture just like the, uh, just like the, the binary examples did before. So our way is that the underlying clean pixel can be deduced by the probabilistic model uh, through the observed noise picture, uh, noise pixels, as well as its neighborhood. So the most probable X or the most probable clean pixels without noise uh, is the one that maximizes the probability given by the probabilistic model. Uh, I think due to the time limit, so I perhaps don't have time to demo this on site, but I will direct show you the results. If you are interested, you can download the scripts from my GitHub. It contains uh, how, uh, the ways how I approach this uh, task here. So in the beginning, we have a noise picture, and by sending this noise picture into the denoising process, we hope that underlying clean picture, or at least some feature, some structure of this, the, of the original information underlying this uh, noise uh, image can be reproduced with multiple iterations. So this is after iteration one, iteration two, and iteration uh, eight. So after eight iterations, the PSNR is significantly improved from 16 to 26. And you can see this high frequency noise is a little bit smeared uh, through our denoising process. So let me make some comparison. So in the beginning, I have a noise picture and then with the noise process. Again, compare with the noise picture here. So the PSNR for the noise picture is 16. After the noise, it increased up to the 26. And this is a, a ground truth picture here. So this is the, my first example on the Bayes image. So now let me move on to my second example that I call it in painting. So before I tell you what in painting really is, let me by telling you what is scratch first. So there's a blue marker pen and a, uh, very, and a clean picture here. And now let me do this. So I just draw some doodles on the, this color image. So this produce this unwanted pattern that are marked by this light blue markers here. So this is quite annoyed. So I would like to know if somehow I can, I'm not only, I'm not only removing these unwanted markers here, but I can also make the computer to fill in the possible underlying pixels on this scratched region. So before telling the impending, this is a scratch. So the goal here is to remove such scratch and try to guess 
or to deduce what kind of the, uh, what kind of true pixel values underlying uh, this scratch here. Again, we have our nine pixel here aggregating together. So this is the original information. So by scratching these pixels, it actually become NA, which means not available. So a scratch really means as if the somehow the information of the original pixel are scratched, are lost, so they cannot be seen at this moment here. So we use X, X means unknown, to denote it such scratch here. So this light blue region, these are not just not color, this light blue, I, I use this light blue to indicate that such region is already scratched. So the goal is to restore the possible NA, the, the, the possible information that original, was the original contains this NA here. In order to do that, I have to, I have to, I have tried to um, guess a possible value on this NA region because I cannot send this picture into uh, the restoration process and tell the computer that I don't know what this region is. Please just guess. Please just try to restore it. That's not gonna possible. We have to fill the gap here. So this makes the, our prior knowledge or our prior guess on the NA region. Please do note that this prior guess is actually not the, not the true value or not the, or not the results after uh, in painting, this is just our prior guess. So what is, you might want to ask, so what is the most uh, correct or most good guess on the, on the, on, on this scratch region? Uh, in general, the, there are plethora of choices, but as I mentioned in the part one, I will particularly choose, I will particularly choose the prior here based on the maximum entropy criteria. So that it means this blue value here, I randomly sampled uh, from this color node spread. And when each one, I select one from here and assign it into this uh, not available, uh, into this square region. So this time, this composed a prior knowledge or a prior image on um, the scratch uh, image here. So this is the prior value of the X, uh, and I did it with the maximum entropy criteria. And then we have a prior guess on this scratch region, then I can send it to our probabilistic model or the mathematical model that describes the correlations uh, between the adjacent pixels. So the most uh, probable X or the most uh, correct X in this scratch region, the, the most uh, correct color can be obtained or can be estimated by the one that maximizes the probability predicted by our probabilistic models here. Okay, so uh, again, uh, let me direct show you my results here. So the scratch regions here, I particularly select this region out, doing in this region to make you see clear that there are some uh, a scratch on the cat's eyes here, so I want to restore it. Then the prior guess uh, before sending into the restoration process, I have to have some guess on the scratch region. So if it, my prior guess satisfying the maximum entropy, so you can see that our the prior color on this scratch region are just a bunch of color noise. So this is okay, because this is now our definitive results here. So such color noise is okay. This is just our prior guess on this issue. Then I can send it into the iteration, pro in the, in, into the uh, uh, restoration process and see if the results can significantly improve after uh, multiple uh, iterations. Okay, so this is after one iteration. So you can see that some of the uh, color noise are reduced. Second iteration and five iterations. So this is how I proceed to implant it the scratch region uh, from the Bayesian reasoning. So to see again, the original scratch image, prior guess on the scratch regions after iteration one, iteration two, and iteration five. So you can see the PSNR also significantly improve uh, compared to the original uh, scratch the picture, uh, let me see. Okay, so the, 
uh, the first, after the first iteration, this is 20, and now it increased up to 24. So, uh, by giving the, the, these two examples, first is the denoising, uh, the second is the impending, you might want to ask that uh, how many iterations that uh, I have to do in this restoration process. The answer uh, uh, is we don't have a definite rules to characterize uh, how many iterations you need. The criteria I use to stop my program is to base on the PS PSNR value here. Now, if the PSNR uh, does not change, then I stop uh, my algorithm. So stop calculating, stop wasting my time. And I will consider the restoration process is good in this case. But to the physical, uh, to the physical case that actually you don't have any underlying clean picture to compare. So the PSNR cannot be obtained in general. So to the, uh, pre to, uh, to the practical reason that actually you cannot, character, uh, you cannot know when to stop uh, by calculating such a PSNR value. So a good way is to you set up uh, a stopping criteria that, okay, so you set up, uh, say that uh, the program must be stopped after, multi after five iteration because in the general case, I found that the picture can be completely restored after five iterations or the or maybe that, okay, I'm quite satisfied with the current outcome of my algorithm. So you can stop your, uh, you can stop your program at any iterations uh, when, you, uh, when you see that uh, the result is good enough for you. So there's no definitive way to choose the how many iterations I need in general. So now the, Third one would be blind deconvolution. But the blind deconvolution is a little bit different from the previous two because uh, this way it is not from uh, the restor restoration process are not generally from the mark of blanket. Uh, it's a little bit different. So now before I tell you what is the convolution, let me by telling you what is convolution first. Uh, I would like, I think that most of the people in, uh, in this room are familiar with convolution because you learn a lot about uh, deep learning, so some of convolution you know, layer, something like that. But actually convolution has vast meanings in mathematical perspective. So let me tell you more about some other convolutions or some other physical uh, practice about convolution here. So somehow I'm working, on the, I'm working on the street and I see a cute dog here. So I see this dog is really cute, so I want to uh, take a pictures of such dog. So I pull out my camera or I pull out my cell phone and try to take a picture of it. But somehow my cell phone or my ca camera just slips through my hands. So uh, when the camera falls out to the, to the ground, then somehow this camera just take a picture here. But due to the camera motion, so the digital image taken by this camera is significant blur compared to the original clean image here. So you might suggest that, well, why bother the deconvolution case? Because if I take a wrong picture, I can retake it again. But in the in practical sense, sometimes this is not possible. In this case, when the camera fell down to the floor, this dog is spooked and run away. So I actually don't have another shot to retake the picture again. So we want to ask if we can reverse the process that's to restore the underlying clean pattern of these cute dog pictures. So let me take a, uh, take a stop at the mathematical perspective on the camera blur and tell you the, what this convolution really is. In general, we have a clean picture, which is the clean dog here. We call it the X, but this picture is actually hidden. So in general, it is unobserved. We call it X, and we have a motion trajectory, which is a camera blur. By convoluting the X and the motion blur K, we will get a blur image that we call Y. So this is uh, my observation of the picture that taken by my camera due to my butter fingers. So, this straightforward process is called convolutions. 
Now, in this talk, my goal is to reverse this process. So the straightforward called convolution, and the reverse is called the deconvolution. So by reversing this process, I hope that I can get an underlying clean picture X without retaking the pictures again, because uh, practically speaking, it perhaps is not possible. So the goal here, X and K, X is the underlying picture, clean picture, K is the motion trajectory, or sometimes it call, call this K the motion blur, or someone called the point spur function, PSF. No matter which name you call, that's fine. We use K to denote that. So we send it into our mathematical model. So we have an observation Y, and we will try to estimate X and K. So as stated in the part one, uh, this term may be hard to do. So we rewrite it through the Bayes rule and decompose it into the three parts because we have three parameters. Uh, so we have two parameters and one observation to be estimated. So the, uh, the hard part is, we are, it's hard to, uh, to build this model because this is just convolution mathematically, but the hard part is to know the prior knowledge on X and K because, okay, so the K, uh, so the, uh, sorry, so the orthodox way to do that, or there are two common ways to do that in the academic sense that we can actually estimate X and K through some uh, guess, prior guess uh, on this motion blur. So this is the first way. We don't have to really know uh, what's the prior knowledge on X or K. We're just starting from certain K. So this K, this motion blur, uh, sometimes it can be a vertical line or can be a horizontal line or can be something else. Even a delta function is okay. So you're starting from this a random K, random, uh, random camera motion, and send it into the probabilistic model, so we get a first estimate on the clean image K. But this is due to the, this, clean, this X is estimated by the wrong K. Of course, it is not uh, quite correct, but it's fine. We hope or we expect that this X, uh, uh, this X predicted by this probabilistic model should be close or approach to the uh, correct solution. So in that case, we use this X, this underlying possible clean image to re-estimate K again, because this X is probably close to the correct one, so we hope that this K, re-estimate K, can be close to the true motion trajectory again, and we use that to estimate, we use this K to estimate K again. So by repeating these two process, eventually when the criteria, stop criterion is met, uh, when the stop criterion is are met, we will get a clean picture and a possible trajectories. On the other hand, because the X, the prior on X in general is now, uh, cannot be ob obtained, as I mentioned in the part one, that the uh, Ensemble state for a full HD picture is in general a uh, gargantuan. So if you enlarge the picture, so the ensemble increase uh, significantly. So knowing that K is in general not possible, so Anna Levin uh, and David Whips and Zhang Haichao, they propose another way to do that is by marginalizing this X. So it means that in this second way to do that, we actually consider that this X, our underlying uh, parameter, is a nuisance parameter, and we remove it uh, from our model through the modularization. So in that case, we, have a, uh, we will have a simple probabilistic model that describes Y and K only. So the K can be obtained, and then we use such K uh, to estimate the X through the number of convolutions. But this one has some trouble that's this modularization may be not converge or maybe unstable. So in general, and also it is hard to do. So in this talk, I will focus on the first part, the common way to do that. Uh, and to your knowledge, we will work on the uh, Fourier space compared to the traditional pixel space. The Fourier space is a, a more efficiency because in the pixel space, we take O n squared time, but in the Fourier space, we take O n times log n time. So the efficiency is simply, uh, is going to improve. And, okay, so I think 
I have some time to do an on-site demo. So, in the beginning, we have a blockhead, and by sending into the restoration process, I ask this restoration process to access the PSF, which is a motion trajectory, and the underlying true clean picture. And here's the outcome. So this is the blockhead, and this is the def uh, and this is a refocus cat here. And by zooming in, the blur one, and the refocus. And this is a possible uh, motion trajectory. But this uh, motion trajectory is, in general, not quite correct uh, through this uh, Bayesian uh, inference. But somehow, in this case, that we use some non-bright convolution that is not sensitive to the, some small error of the blur kernel. Of this, the errors in the blur kernel will be significantly enlarged. Enlarged. Uh, in, uh, in the final results here. So, so let me get back to my slide. So now I uh, finished this uh, hands-on example. So in this part, I briefly describe what is the Bayesian denoise in painting, as well as the blind convolution that introduced the two methods to do that uh, by simultaneously estimate X and K, or by estimated K, by estimated K through the axis marginalization. So in the last part, I would like to have a quick uh, in comparison between the CNN method and the traditional method that use the convolutional autoencoder. So the preliminary, uh, the very naive way if, uh, in the noise, ca the noise case, if we send this noise image into our model, firstly, it goes through some encoder. So such encoder works like a principal component analysis. It reduces the dimension of the original image so eventually we get a compressed data uh, in the middle and then send this compressed data to the decoder and restore uh, the, 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 the underlying dimensions of your outcome. So after through this encoder and decoder, the unwanted features are removed. So this is how we understand CAE uh, in a conceptual way. But I will not conduct a, a detailed calculation here. I will just show you the results. So some application of the CAE is denoising in paintings as well as the super resolutions, auto painting, style transfer, etc. And so, a comparison this is a noise image, the noise through CAE. And we have also, again, a scratch region here, and impended after CAE. So, enlarge this uh, picture, uh, enlarge these regions here. You can see that CAE restore the possible pixels of these brown circles here. So, the results are taken from mouse paper. Okay, so now due to the time limit, uh, let me conclude here. So in this talk, the basic inference in the computer vision, application in the computer vision is briefly given uh, with these three examples, and also compare with a CAE. So there are plenty of ways to do that, not only these two, you can do it with the partial differential equation method or variational method as well as the basic inference a general framework that can uh, be applied to multiple uh, domains, uh, so not only to the computer vision problems. So I should stop my talk here, and if I have time to take some questions. Thank you. Okay, so we probably have some time to take questions. So, the bin K tier Negua slide or home. Oh, then shall we send you Negus slide or some minute? 
就是我直接念嘛，好，那我直接念好了。那个，呃，第一个问题是 ：In the in painting session, how does the computer decide whether a certain pixel is an original pixel or a scratched pixel before iterating the value、uh, yeah, of okay. it? So you have to in the in painting process, you have to send in your scratch、uh, scratch image. And of course, you have to send in another mask that indicated where、uh, which pixel regions are actually、uh, scratched. So you have to send two information into your restoration process. One is the scratch,、uh, one is the、uh, scratch picture. The other is a mask that indicating where it's scratched. Oh,、yeah. 那第二个跟第第一个有一点相关，就也是 in painting. In painting 的时候 ，scratch 笔画的宽度如何影响 restore 效能？呃、哦，我不太懂笔画宽度是什么意思。是谁问的？可以啊，不然的话，如果啊，用麦克风，用麦克风，前面那个，哎、欸，就是那个呃，你你笔画越细，它呃，跟宽的话，它是不是会有一个极限？就是说，你宽到一个程度，它就没办法捋出。原原则上 ，in painting 这种东西，其实你啊，刚、呃、前面讲，我其实用 L2 嘛，所以 L2 这种东西，你把它想象它的原子，它其实是源自于高斯分布。就是假设 pixel 零件的 pixel 应该要 follow 高斯分布这样子，所以其实按照这种东西的话，它它其实当然它可以很宽，那也可以很细嘛，很细当然 restore 就比较好。那很宽的话，那最后 restore 当然就不好，那就是看起来就是糊糊的，然后很明显就糊糊了，因为你一开始是先随便填一个 color。那我进去嘛，就我随便插一些可能的颜色在里面。然后我接下来有点类似尝试用这一种 L2， 就是尝试就是按照邻近的像素分布，然后我去猜说这个最有可能的像素值到底是多少。那基本上这个 follow L2 的话，那来自高斯分布的话，那其实结果就是有点像高斯 smear。所以其实这样子的 likelihood model 也许就不是很好，或者是你可，或者是当使用者在建的时候，比较专业的人士他可以再去 impose 其他的 constraint。对 x 有其他的 concern， 就是 prior x， 比如可以考虑用 image statistic 或者什么其他的方法去做。所以原则上宽度是没有限制的，但是当然越宽 ，restore 的效果 ，restore 的效果就越就越差，这样就越越看起来就是只是单纯的，好像把一个没有细节的颜色填进去而已。对，对所以这种状态的话，就说目前啊，传传统的这种方法，用贝叶斯方法或其他的方法，其实原则上图像的细节基本上是没有办法修复的。主要细节就是说，比如说我很锐利的这些边啊、角啊，或者是呃，比如说我跟背景在边界的时候差异就很大，那这个就是有很大的、很大的变化这样子。那这种东西用传统的方法，其实它不太容易修复这样子。对，那可能是我很有大概有半年没有去 follow 那学界到底或者业界有有没有什么新的方式。那就我呃 ，stop 追这个议题之前，目前没有什么好的办法，至少就贝叶斯。推论这方面来讲是没有什么特别好的方法去做了，但是当然，如果你不要贝叶斯推论，你想要用其他的什么 r e d u c t i o n transformation 或者是用一些偏微分方程的方法，也许他们有其他更好的方法去做。那这个我其实就不是那么清楚了。这样。Can we have the slides? Probably yes. 当然可以啊。OK <笑>。但是我们好像没没有办法放在网络上。呃，有那个，就是如果你在那个后台上传的话，它会直接显示在那个网站上面。啊哈，我可以把 Kino 上，可是当然很大，你们有档案大大小的限制吗？那可能快一百美个。呃，没有，它<笑>就是你要上传到别的地方，我们只收连接。哦，真的、哦？那不然你再写信给我好了。<笑> OK， 在 How to select the prior model？ 没有，就像我前面讲 ，prior model 其实没有一个呃 ，sorry。Uh, this is English question. So, as I mentioned in the slides, that there's no definitive way to select a proper a prior model. So, depends on your preference. So, if I like maximum entropy criteria, in this case, I found that maximum entropy criteria is quite easy to do. So, I particularly choose、uh, maximum entropy criteria. But the,、uh, to the academia's perspective, maybe they despite、uh, they don't like maximum entropy. They tend to use the image statistic to do that. So that's the one way to do. Or as I said before, if you already have a thorough or full investig investigations on your problem, so in general, based on your knowledge, understanding on this problem, you can build up your own prior model. 